On this show, we often cover the big forces of history. How the slow march of material conditions brings nations to the breaking point. It's also fun to cover a series of unfortunate events. Shenanigans, if you will. And the fun thing about this episode is that we get to do both. On the voyage of the damn. Competent, the premier show about why everyone who's ever been in charge is worse at their job than you are at yours. My name is Azalea, and I am joined, of course, of course by my illustrious co-host, Jaharis. Jaharis, how have you been lately? I'm doing all right. Uh, basically, could barely speak most of last week due to allergies, but I'm better now, more or less. Bro, I live in Augusta, Georgia, a place where, like, you can be driving down the wrong part of the road in March and just suddenly what can only be described as a, like, pollen sandstorm, a pollen storm of yellow will just blot out your windshields. <laughs> uh. Yeah. You see, what this and this is fun because the um in 2020, the pollen came out right when COVID hit, right? So everyone's allergies are flaring up right when, like, we're all paranoid about being sick. That was a great weekend. That was, ooh, that was a fun, I called my grandparents and uh, told them that I probably wouldn't be able to see them until May. (laughs) Oh, that was, that was fun. Anyway, the brilliant theme music that you heard at the beginning was done by the legendary Sam Bryce. You can follow us on Twitter at... Azalea Wyatt and at Jaharis48. Put the A's in front of the E's pro tip. And you can reach out to the podcast at no one is competent at gmail.com. On that very subject, we have today a requested episode. This is not our first requested episode, but it's been a while. Let me see. This was by Leo, who reached out to us by email. Uh, I'm not going to say how many <laughs> months ago because it's very, very embarrassing. But Leo, by some god, if for some godforsaken reason you are still listening to this inconsistent, whack ass show, uh, we appreciate you. Listen, if we're measuring, I it- am now realizing that someone emailed me in February uh, that I did not get. Um, back uh god you know if we're measuring it by by months rather than years i think we're i think we're still doing okay yeah 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 that's that's positive uh speaking of months uh happy ramadan everyone listening this is my uh internal challenge to myself to publish this episode uh before ramadan (laughs) ends i got like a whole month right jay like that that shouldn't be too yeah and you know if not you can always just cut them out yeah, but like if I get to the end, <laughs> then it gets harder to cut things out at the beginning. Like it's it gets to be a hole. Uh, anyway, what are we? Uh, what what are we? What are we? What are we fucking freaking licking, bicking? Uh, what, what are we discussing today? Uh, we're talking about the voyage of the damned, which is a nickname for the journey undertaken by the Russian Second Pacific Squadron during the Russo-Japanese War. Now, our sources for this episode include. Uh, the Revolutions Podcast by Mike Duncan, The Tsar's Last Armada by Konstantin Pleshikov, Tsushima 1905 by Mark Lardis, The Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905 by Jeffrey Jukes, The Russian Navy at War by Periti Wuntinen and Bruce Manning, Their Voyage of the Damned by Peter J. Soras, and the Russo-Japanese War at the 18,000-mile voyage on the blog 1870 to 1918. Also, hard shout-out to Azalea's AP European History class. Uh, Mr. Dudley, we don't talk anymore because you have weird politics, but I still uh, 
think you're cool and one of the, like, four good memories of high school. Before we start, Jay, The Voyage of the Damned, um, this was a request from a listener. Uh, Shoutouts to Leo again. Uh, I, um, this was on the short list, I believe, when we started this podcast. And I think, I remember you kind of pushing back on me a little bit because this has been covered to death. Everyone likes to talk about The Voyage of the Damned because it's called The Voyage of the Damned. You know, it's like fun. It's sexy. It's got a, it's, 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 <laughs> It's right there, you know. Why not talk about it? Yeah. And, you know, why not us talk about it? But I uh, I saw the length of the script that you wrote for this, and I uh, think that you you may have... Uh, I'm glad to see you came around on the interesting level of this podcast subject, for lack of a better uh, term. You know, the, the Russo-Japanese War is a war which I've been interested in for a fair amount of time. It's just that this specific part of it, in particular, The Voyage of the Damned, is pretty well covered. There are a lot of, like, pop history type blog posts and articles about it. Um, there's Lines Wet by Donkeys has done episodes on it. I probably read about it on Crack.com in, like, 2012 yeah. <laughs> in between Jack Off sessions. Yeah, there are a lot of YouTube videos, so on and so forth. But I do, when I was reading more about this... I do feel like there's an extra layer of context behind some of the events that not all, but a lot of these more like kind of like pop history type retellings of the story overlook or miss. And that's kind of why I got into it a bit. And it is, I mean, it's popular for a reason. It's a, it's a fun story <laughs> um, in a sort of a schadenfreude sort of way. All right, so recently on the podcast, we've been giving large overviews of big events. You know, that's what most of our episodes on the French Revolution are. This time, we are zooming in, looking at an episode within an episode of world history. This is kind of similar to our episodes on Operation Eagle Claw or the recent one on the Bay of Pigs. Um, you know, just a funny, comical series of events. Though, if you were on the Voyage of the Damned, I doubt you'd find it that comical. But we are, even though we're zooming in, obligated to give you some context. As Jay pointed out, our story is going to take place in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905. Uh, this short but crucial war could be an episode all on its own, and probably will, given the amount of uh, research Jay's already done. But for now, we're going to zoom in, so uh, we'll brutally summarize the events that this... Uh, little trip around the world takes place event. The Russo-Japanese War was interesting because of the somewhat mismatched nature of its combatants. See, in 1904, Russia was a shambling mess of a country. It was massive and rich with resources, but had long fallen behind modern technology. I mean, and only recently at this time, begun completing a railroad that would connect the entire continent. In fact, they were them finishing that railroad was kind of part of how this whole war got kicked off. But this lack of mechanization made its massive size almost a liability. The whole country was bogged down by archaic bureaucracy and hierarchy that made it difficult and effectively for it to use its out-of-date forces. If you've listened to our podcast on Louis the 16th in the French Revolution, these sort of like medieval uh, nature of bureaucracy, judgeships, ancient titles and rituals that just sort of gum up the works of everyday functions of government. In Russia, it's even worse and it's <laughs> gone on for longer. Yeah. I mean, they straight up have surfed him until not long before this <laughs> this takes place. Yeah, yeah, like, like surfed him is within living yeah. memory <laughs> as this is going down. The country is also led by the famously incompetent and indecisive Nicholas II. A further explanation of Russia's failings is beyond the scope of this episode, but uh, just to give you some reference, a year from the events of this podcast... Uh, vast swaths of the country are going to fall into a mixture of, of revolt, civil war, and unorganized genocide that's called the Revolution of 1905. So, that's how they're doing at the moment. 
Now, any class on Russian history will tell you that from the 1500s onwards, much of the country's prospects were defined by their quest for a warm water port. Consistent access to the seas would allow Russia to project power across the globe and take place in that juicy colonialism that's enriching the great powers of Europe. To summarize what could again be another episode, they failed to get this warm water port in Europe, and as the 1600s roll into the 1700s and 1800s, Russia falls further behind its western peers. But Russia does span half a continent, and thus in the late 1800s started looking up at building a port on the Pacific coast. Most of this coast was frozen, but if they expanded south, they could get their hands on a warm water port, and this, of course, runs them straight into the Japanese. Now, of course, it would be wrong to call Japan a young country in this period, but they certainly felt like one in contrast to Russia in many ways. The nation was barely 50 years removed from the Meiji Restoration, which again should be its own episode. The long story short is that after a brief civil war, Japan overhauled its entire government and attempted to emulate Western nations. This meant adopting new technologies, investing heavily in their military, and brutally colonizing everything that they could get their hands on. Ten years prior, they fought a decisive war with China and tried to get a hold of the Laodong Peninsula, which I am almost certainly mispronouncing. And that Laodong Peninsula is exactly where the Russians want to build their warm water port. Now, two years later, the Russians go ahead and occupy the peninsula, building Port Arthur in spite of Japanese claims. The two nations spend a few years dancing back and forth. Um, Russia shows a lot of arrogance, often belittles Japanese diplomats. Uh, Tsar Nicholas himself had it held a violent personal bigotry towards the Japanese after an uncomfortable visit there in his youth. Uh, he basically just did not co uh, think they were cognitively capable yeah. <laughs> of opposing him. Uh, I remember in the Revolutions podcast, uh, Mike Duncan talks about correspondence between Wilhelm of Germany and uh, Nicholas II about the Japanese. And uh, Wilhelm was urging Nicholas to go to war, and one of them, I forget who, but they, they called them yellow monkeys, okay? Like, this is a level of racism that obviously probably does exist in some levels today, but it is kind of outside our modern conceptualization. Yeah. Um, but suffice to say, uh, Nicholas didn't exactly think he was even capable of losing. There's this whole saga of diplomacy going back and forth between the nations, Japan getting more and more annoyed. But we're going to skip ahead to February 8th of 1904, when Japan looked at the situation as like, how hard could it be? So they launched a surprise attack on Port Arthur and declared war simultaneously. This strategy of a sneak attack and declaring war at the same time would work out really, really, really well uh, for Japan in this instance, and then look very, very, very funny in the long course of history. But for now, uh, the attack on Port Arthur was a devastating opening to the war. So you can see the one of the reasons why this conflict is so heavily covered is there's a very clear narrative running through it, all right? You know, you've got this large but bumbling Russia versus this small yet bold Japan. And it's very evocative in the mind, right? Yeah. Japan had generally more modern ships, better planning, better officers, and a decisive initiative. Russia had more stuff... But using that stuff in a nation with such inadequate transportation and organization would be the challenge. The nation was caught off guard by the attack in every way, and their response would be awkward and uncoordinated. And it is the most awkward and least coordinated of those responses that we will be discussing today. Of course, a naval response. So, Jake, could you give us a rundown on the state of the Russian Navy in 1904? How bad could it be, I ask? <laughs> um, well, I think in order to properly answer that, you kind of have to look at where this institution is coming from. 
because obviously, you know, it didn't just pop into existence right at the start of the war. Though, I don't know if that would have made it better or worse if it did. <laughs> now, the Imperial Russian Navy, like so many aspects of the Russian state, traced its origins back to the reign of Peter the Great. Peter held a personal interest in sailing and shipbuilding, and viewed the possession of a modern navy as a necessity for his burgeoning Russian Empire. I had like three classes in high school and college that were like, you fuck materialism and learning about the mind. You need to know that Peter the Great <laughs> fucking loved ships. Yeah. This is the guy who like, that people do not like, there's two things you immediately learn about Peter the Great. He was tall as fuck <laughs> and he liked sailing. Yeah. Does that, does the two top bullet points that every 10th grader has beaten into their head about him. Yeah. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Peter the Great loved himself a yeah. boat. Like, he'll personally apprentice himself to, like, a shipyard in the Netherlands and, like, work, you know, physically building ships for a little while. But anyway, so the Russian Navy is thus formed by him in 1696, with sailors and shipwrights brought in from across Europe to assist in its creation. Now, under Peter, the Russian Navy grew to become a pretty powerful force, but by the 18th century, it had fallen into a state of disrepair. The reason for this was simple. In spite of Peter's aspirations, the navy remained distinctly secondary in terms of importance to the army in Russia's wars, and thus was not given equal priority to the army by successive Russian courts. The navy, for example, would play very little role in the wars against Napoleonic France. As noted by the fact that they have yet to show up <laughs> in our... Uh stupidly long series we are doing on Napoleonic France. Yeah. Why did I ever agree to that? Oh wait, it was my No, don't don't let him don't let him remember that. Anyway, keep going, Jay. Now as the 19th century progressed, attitudes began to change. Funding for the navy burgeoned during the reigns of Alexander III and his son Nicholas II. Like Peter, Nicholas held both a romantic view of the sea, though unlike Peter, he wasn't a sailor himself. And he also had the belief that in order to remain a strong country, Russia needed a first-rate navy. In this, he was simply aligned with the orthodoxy of his era. The development of steam power freed ships from being totally dependent on the whims of nature allowing fleets to project power far more reliably than ever before. The works of theorists such as Alfred Fair Mahan, which I, I did read some of when I was in my peak naval war nerd uh, days in high school, uh, convinced leaders that domination of the seas was key to the fate of great powers. It, it, it's hard to stress how much, like, I, obviously they were right in a lot of ways, but this is like one of the first, I guess you could say, um, phenomena or trends in military history or in like IR that was pushed by academia and like smart people being like, we should do this. And uh, nation leaders all across the world being like, yeah, they're probably right. And, you know, that's probably because the thing they wanted to do was build, like, really big, shiny ship fleets of ships with big guns. Yeah. <laughs> and that's cool. And everybody likes big, shiny ships with big guns. Jay, would you say that's right about academia and policy? Yeah, I would say that's right. Um, you know, this is kind of... I don't want to say the height, because it's still a thing today, but, like, this is kind of, like, really the... Um, there's a very strong relationship at this point between admiralties, particularly in places like the United Kingdom and the United States, and academia. You know, this is when a lot of new technologies are coming out, um, you know, from universities and uh, scientists or whatever, which have a direct impact on the Navy. So they're very interconnected at this point in time. Like, for context, at this point in 1904, the president of the United States is Theodore Roosevelt, a man whose, like, first significant thing he did in life right after college was, like, write an academic book, yeah. <laughs> which was an analysis of the Navy in the War of 1812, yeah. which became required reading in 
U.S. Naval Academies. So, <laughs> this is not just like, oh, some guys are saying stuff. This is like what leaders of nation states are thinking about. All right, so, yeah. These guys like Mahan convinced leaders that domination of the seas was key to the fate of great powers. Battleships became the ultimate symbol of national might in a way they had never before been, with countries throughout the world engaging in naval arms races with their rivals. In Russia, the navy once again became the darling of the court, with money flowing into its coffers and awards lavished upon its officers. Now, in theory, this tension should have led to the creation of a first-rate force. In reality, the Russian Navy was uh, played by flaws that would hinder its performance in the Russo-Japanese War. And now, to get the most obvious one out of the way, and one which, in fairness, isn't really their fa fault, Russia's geography does not really lend itself to Russia being a top naval power. Russia, of course, does have a massive coastline, but most of that coastline is locked away along Russia's north, too remote and too icy to be of use for the navy. You know, at least until global warming becomes a thing, so, uh, you know, quite a bit later. Imperial Russia was, in essence, forced by its geography to maintain three separate navies, one in the Baltic, one in the Black Sea, and one in the Pacific. Combining even two of these fleets in the case of a war would be an arduous task, requiring ships to travel great distances or transit through choke points controlled by Russia's geopolitical rivals. You know, if you want to get the Black Sea fleet out of the Black Sea, you have to go through Constantinople, which is controlled by Turkey, and Turkey generally doesn't like Russia during this time period. Side note, when Peter the Great died, he left a note to his uh, successor and all of his successors afterward uh, <laughs> that just said, take Constantinople. They, 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 taking Constantinople, like, it's honestly hilarious how much Russia dreams of that. It's to the point where when they get Vladivostok, which is a port in Siberia, they will name the bay that it's on the Golden Horn after the golden horn of Constantinople. <laughs> it's like they literally pull a, a golden ho horn at home. <laughs> we have we have Constantinople. We, we've gone to it before. Like Istanbul's not the hardest city to take on in the world. But like, when you look at the walls, when you look at the Ottoman fleet around it, like... Bro, pick another city, man. <laughs> and, you know, in another very obvious episode topic, which we'll probably cover someday, uh, in, in World War I, you can see that trying to force a fleet through the straits is not very easy to do. <laughs> a little something called the Gallipoli campaign shows that. But, yeah. Oh, yeah, that thing that was on the short list of uh, episode <laughs> ideas before the podcast started. Yeah. We still haven't got to. But yeah, anyways, moving on, the, uh, the prestige afforded to the Navy turned its officer corps into something of a social club for Russia's elites. Ranks were used as status symbols by the nobility, who made up most of the Navy's leadership. By the start of the war, Russia had 100 admirals, as more than Britain and Germany combined. And, you know, the Royal Navy is several times larger than the Russian Navy, and they don't have as many admirals. Now, many of these admirals spent a little time at sea. This nepotism came from the top. The man in charge of the navy for most of this period was Nicholas II's favorite uncle, the Grand Duke Alexei. Now, Alexei did actually spend a fair amount of time at sea, but he generally preferred the social aspects of the job over the military ones. It's worth noting that the first uh, phases of Nicholas's reign uh, were heavily dominated by him uh, getting essentially bullied by his uncles uh, yeah. <laughs> and more or less doing whatever he was told by them because uh, Nicholas could not say no to anyone. <sighs> Nikki, Nikki, Nikki. The thing about Nicholas that always gets me is that, like, when you look at his personality, he should be, like, a small bean, right? Yeah. Like, he strikes as this 
people pleaser, super nice. He hates conflict, right? Like, he'll famously have tea with somebody for two hours in the afternoon, and then they get back to their desk, and they find out by letter that they've been fired. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, 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 guy hated conflict. He was polite. Uh, he loved his kids. And But, like, that conflicts with the fact that this dude's like, yes, please genocide the Jews. <laughs> like, fucking shoot those protesters in the fucking head. Like, burn them at the stake. The, du the dude was f bloodthirsty as shit on, at, like, morally bankrupt on levels not conceivable. Deserved everything that happened to him. And, like, um, and his wife was just as bad, by the way. And... The, in fact, pushed him to be worse. Uh, that's what I love about um, N Nicholas and uh, and Alex as a as a power couple is that like they're like one of the power couples of nobility, and it's it's all for the everything they do is the worst. Um, and so in conflict with him just being a jittery, nervous, people pleasing weirdo who's easy to bully. Yeah, like, I'm of the opinion that Nicholas II is the single greatest argument against monarchism. But, anyways. Uh, it, it should be of little surprise that in such an aristocratic system, corruption was endemic. Much of the money set aside for the navy made its way into the personal accounts of admirals and their associates, something that was pretty much an open secret throughout Europe. Kaiser Wilhelm II once stated that the Russians could not purchase a ship without Grand Duke Alexei pocketing a quarter of a million rubles. In spite of this corruption, ships were acquired, but the Navy then economized on its remaining budget by spending very little on maintenance and training. Yeah, because, like, you buy a ship, and then, like, the nobles get to be like, oh, yeah, you know, crack some champagne and have a party, <laughs> but then, like, no one wants to, like, you know, pay for maintenance or train a crew, you know, that's not... It's not important. <laughs> now, whereas the Navy's officers were largely drawn from the nobility, its enlisted men were mostly conscripts, many of them peasants from the Russian interior who had never seen the sea before entering service. This was in contrast to most other top na navies of the era, including the Japanese Navy, which had much higher rates of volunteers to fill out their ranks. Service as an enlisted man in the Russian Navy was not seen as a desirable career. The pay was low, and the officers were prone to inflicting corporal punishment upon their crews. That means a whip, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Morale was generally quite low, as most sailors were aware of their own lack of training and ability. Uh, quick history check. Percentage of these guys that can swim... I don't know off the top of my head. I'm going to guess it's probably like higher than it was in like a 19th century or early 19th century navies, but it's still um, lower than you would want. <laughs> Half? Third? Maybe. Maybe that. I yeah, mean, okay. there, there okay. are also specific reasons, which we'll get into later, why the fleet we're talking about today is is maybe lower than the uh, than the Russian Navy as a whole. Yeah. And before we move on, I would like to note about the Russian nobility that Russian czars had tried for centuries to get the massive squabbling nobility of Russia under control, and they had all failed uh, for more uh, on that CR episode on Paul. And uh, these guys are just obsessed with status, uh, and they hate change, and they are in many ways a barrier to Russia's modernization and when they're not a barrier to Russia's modernization it's because they're you know fucking corrupt stuff in their pockets the whole time these people fully believe that they are just better than all other human beings because God says so um you I, I reiterate that a lot in our episodes because I feel like a lot of the actions of the people we cover make no sense unless you remember that they have a mindset that is just not really seen today outside of, like, fascists. There's a reason that no one is competent. Yeah. It's because their brains were fucking bad. Yeah. Not because they were born that way, but because they were raised that way. But Azalea, are you saying that your culture is su superior to theirs? Yes. <laughs> the Russian Pacific Fleet at the start of 1904 was on paper at least roughly equal to the Japanese Navy. 
I love those modifiers. Based out of Port Arthur, Based out of Port Arthur, the 1st Pacific Squadron had 7 battleships, 9 armored cruisers, 2 protected cruisers, 24 destroyers, and 17 torpedo boats. Now, the Japanese Navy in comparison had 6 battleships, 8 armored cruisers, 8 protected cruisers, 19 destroyers, and 28 torpedo boats. This meant that the Russians actually had more heavily armored ships than the Japanese, but the Japanese were on average faster than their Russian counterparts. Um, okay, so I don't want to like go too long on this, Jay, but really quick, uh, my understanding is that battleships are like the big, huge things covered with armor and are kind of like these hulking melee things. Like they get close and they just bam, 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 bam. Um, they're like tanks on the sea. Yes. Whereas destroyers are nimbler, faster, less armor, longer range. That's, um, yeah. Yes, battleships are basically the winchpin for a battle line. They are the heavily, um, they are the, the most heavily armored and the most heavily armed ships. Cruisers kind of fit in the middle. Uh, armored cruisers are actually somewhat close to being battleships. You know, just a little bit lighter in terms of arms and armament. And protected cruisers are even lighter. So these are more mobile, they're faster, they're cheaper to build, um, but they're a little bit less strong. And yeah, then destroyers are are the smaller units. They are much more faster and maneuverable. And uh, torpedo yeah, boats... We're going to get into uh, torpedo yeah, boats we'll get, we'll later, get to right them later Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, the reasons are, besides the boy, board game that you don't see battleships anymore, is because... The meta changed in history. Yeah. <laughs> this is a point where battleships are the important thing to have. Yes. Because airplanes do exist in uh, 1904, but you do not want to get one. <laughs> Especially not over, over uh, flying over the water. Yeah. To summarize, the Russians have more heavily armored ships, but the Japanese ships are faster on average. In the opening months of the war, the Russian government and Admiralty still held out hopes of the 1st Pacific Squadron. The night attack on Port Arthur, conducted primarily with torpedoes, had managed to put two Russian battleships and one cruiser out of action. But the bulk of the fleet remained sound. The Japanese fleet followed up this attack by implementing a blockade of Port Arthur, a technique expected by the Russians. The Russians hoped that the Japanese fleet would exhaust itself trying to blockade Port Arthur and the first Pacific Squadron would just have to wait for the opportune time to sortie out and finish their enemy. This hope, however, would soon fall apart. The Japanese Navy managed to set up coaling stations on islands near the Laodan Peninsula. That's not cooling stations, that's coaling stations where they get the coal to put in the furnace to make the, you know, steamboat go toot toot. This reduced the logistical burden on their blockading fleet. It's also a pretty obvious thing to do. I really don't I know why the Russians that... didn't expect this. <laughs> like, I read like, about They're, they're this, planning like... to take over the Laodong Peninsula anyway. Like, like, that was the whole point. Yeah, like, the whole idea is like, oh, like, the Japanese ships are going to have to be, like, sailing back and forth to Japan. Like, that's going to cause a lot of wear and tear, which is true, but, like, there are a lot of small little islands which are, like, not very guarded by, like, anybody. I really don't know why the Russians didn't think the Japanese would just set up shop on one of them. They're not very smart. These Russians. All of the Russian peasants are probably pretty smart. These guys are not smart. In April, the Russian flagship, which has a name that I am not going to attempt to pronounce, struck a Japanese mine and sank, taking the 1st Pacific's commander... Admiral Stefan Makarov with it. Japanese soldiers, meanwhile, landed to, uh, to the north and began to fight their way down the peninsula, threatening to take Port Arthur by land. The first of its squadron could no longer be counted upon to turn the tide against the Japanese. In April 1904, the decision was made to form a second Pacific squadron out of the ships and crews of the Baltic fleet and send it on a long voyage to the east. So before we start... Let's just state at the baseline that the Voyage of the Damned was taken by a fleet that did not exist before the Voyage of the Damned. 
Yeah. So if this seems like a, you know, hodgepodge of, of ships thrown together at the last minute to do an idea that was stupid in the first place, it's because it is. <laughs> Now, one of the first decisions made by the Russian Admiralty was to select a man to lead this great relief mission. Now, Russia obviously had no shortage of admirals, as we've talked about, but many of them attempted to find excuses as to not be chosen as the commander of the second squadron. The reason was simple. Most of them thought the mission was doomed. The Russian Navy had never undertaken such a vast wartime mission before. Even if it could be accomplished, the ships arriving in the Far East would obviously be worn down by the travails of the journey, and they would then have to face an enemy that had proven itself to be quite capable. After all, the Japanese fleet, which was under the leadership of Admiral Togo Heiachiro, had already killed one Russian admiral. So just to be clear, the Russians had never sent a full fleet from one coast to the other. In wartime, and like also okay. in the a age of steam, like they'll you know send ships to the U.S. during the Civil War, um, to, you know to show support for the Union, but it's not in wartime. Yeah, never on this scale. Yeah. Now, in the end, the man chosen by the Admiralty and the Tsar was one Rear Admiral Zinovy Rozhetsvensky. Honestly, the fact that he's a rear admiral gives me a little, like, more confidence in him given yeah. this system. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, for those who don't know, that's actually the low end of, of being an admiral. Um, he's technically outranked by most admirals in the Russian Navy. But remember, most of those admirals have never stepped on a ship before, so that's good. <laughs> yeah. Now, Roshetsvensky actually did have several positive qualities. Unlike most of his colleagues, he came from a middle-class background, uh, he was a son of a doctor, and thus he had to rise through the ranks through skill alone. He was intelligent, with a strong interest in new technologies, and capable and energetic. Above all else, he was one of the few Russian admirals who was seen as being above petty corruption. It's likely these qualities that endeared him to superiors, including Grand Duke Alexei and even the Tsar, who viewed him as a reliable officer who could carry out his duties competently and without scheming. In 1903, he was made head of the naval general staff, essentially putting him in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the navy. That being said, Roshetsvensky was not without his flaws. He was known to possess a severe temper and was prone to flying into fits of rage against his subordinates. Now, most admirals by this time had generally come to discourage the use of corporal punishment, but Roshetsvensky was not above punching sailors who bungled their duties. He also had the habit of throwing his binoculars into the sea during moments of rage. Before departing for the East, his staff would make sure to requisition a set of 50 binoculars, well aware that most of them would end up littering the ocean floor. Literally the, uh, the Admiralty version of throwing your controller yeah. at the end of a match. Yeah. <laughs> but, from what you described, like, I'm gonna say, considering this guy is a naval officer in Russian, like, I don't think this guy ha really has a temper by the standards. Of the day. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. this is all. I mean, I'm sure these guys are going off vodka sodomy in the lash, you know? Like, yeah. Being a sailor has never been fun, uh, minus the sodomy in the rum. But, I. Uh, yeah. This, like, I. This is all perfectly standard for, like, the history of European, uh,. Naval yeah, cor corporal punishment was the norm in European navies for a very long period of time. It's only around, like, really European armies and, and navies kind of start moving away from it um, around the time of the French Revolution. Uh, the French ban it during the Revolution. And that kind of starts the trend of, like, moving that, um, getting away from that practice. But within especially in places like russia it remained common up up until you know 1905 i mean there are people who will say it, it's you still have a lot of hazing and whatnot in the russian military today um it's just done you know more informally 
for reasons that are hard to nail down, navies are always slower to change in terms of culture than armies are. Uh, the sea is primordial in nature. It is old and slow to change. And those who uh, go to it, uh, their brains are calcified by the salt, and uh, they, they, they become one with the brine. Uh, hard <laughs> and harsh. Now... You know, in spite of his anger, Roshetsvansky actually was respected by many of his sailors. While he was harsh, he was also fair. He would yell at both officers and enlisted men alike. Uh, he would actually say that he wished he could beat his officers. Um, it's just that he can't because, like, they're mostly nobles. Um, conversely, he was more than willing to reward men who proved themselves to be capable regardless of their rank. Roshesvinsky was probably the best man available for the job of leading the 2nd Pacific Squadron. Like many of his colleagues, he did not want the honor, viewing it as a fool's errand. He was, however, a loyal officer, and upon receiving the position from the Tsar, he set about doing the most he could do to ensure its success. The next major question facing the Russians was what ships to send to the Far East. The Baltic fleet was a large force, but many of its ships were, as we mentioned, old and in a poor state of repair. Roshetsvinsky wanted to leave the clunkers behind, knowing that they would only slow his fleet down during the voyage and in a potential battle with the Japanese. The naval minister and Grand Duke Alexei disagreed, stating that as many ships as possible should be sent to overwhelm the Japanese with sheer numbers. Roshetsvinsky ultimately got his way, though he was forced to accept a handful of older vessels. In the end, the second squadron would consist of seven battleships, seven cruisers, nine destroyers, and various other support vessels, coming to around a total of 50 ships. So just to recap, the Russians had one fleet in the area that was roughly equal to the Japanese, and it is currently in the process of losing very hard. Yeah. Uh, and they are now going to send another fleet that is roughly equal uh, to the Japanese. So, on paper, you know, surely that's got to do the trick. <laughs> yeah. You know, what could go wrong? We're going to find out. While Rochitzvinsky's battleship force actually outnumbered that of Togo's, the Japanese had more and better cruisers. Remember, those are the mid-class ships. To alleviate this, Roshetsvinsky proposed the purchase of up to seven modern European-made cruisers from Argentina and Chile. Tensions in South America during the late 1800s had resulted in a naval arms race, with many nations buying up modern ships from European shipyards. As the 20th century began, those tensions largely diffused, and now these governments were looking to offload their expensive purchases. Indeed, just prior to the war, Japan had managed to outbid Russia to acquire two cruisers from Argentina. The Tsar agreed with this proposal. He would make the effort to purchase the ships and have them join with the second squadron en route to the Far East. I, we, pr we don't have time to get into it, but I, I did not know that about South America in the 1800s uh, naval arms race. There was, like, a weird time where, like, the Brazilian Navy was stronger than the United States Navy. <laughs> um, Fun alternate history. Yeah, I, I'm not going to purport to be an expert on South American history. I think, like a lot of people from North America, we don't learn... I, I did not learn much about South American history. Um, there are many brilliant uh, scholars of South American history, and none of them have a platform. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, there is... This period, um, right before this period, yeah, like they're buying up ships like crazy. So basically they're assuming that seven shiny uh, cruisers are going to join them at some point. Trust me, yeah. bro. Yeah. I mean, the Tsar, the Tsar said it's going to happen. And we all know that when Nikki says something, it's going to happen. Now, finally, the route itself had to be decided upon and arrangements made for provisioning the fleet. Here, the Russians ran up against challenges of both geography and politics. Now, the shortest route from the Baltic to the Pacific was, of course, to sail around Europe into the Mediterranean and through the Suez Canal to reach the Indian Ocean. The Suez Canal, however, at that point was under British control. 
And for much of the 19th century, Britain had been Russia's main geopolitical foe, checking Russian expansion into the Mediterranean and Central Asia. If you've heard of something called the Great Game, that's what we're talking about. This is even the fun part of the Great Game, where, yeah. like, <laughs> dumbass Brits are getting their heads shot off by Afghanis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in 1902, Britain enters into an alliance with Japan, which is designed in large part to curtail Russia. Russia and Britain were not at war with each other, and thus the British were by treaty meant to allow Russian warships safe passage through the canal. But the Russians feared that the British would come up with some legal technicality to block their fleet or prevent it from taking on supplies. The use of Suez for the main part of Rochetsvensky's fleet was thus ruled out. Uh, with Suez no longer an option, the second Pacific squadron would have to do it the old-fashioned way, sailing all the way around the tip of Africa. This too was not without challenges. The distance would be far greater, of course. Russia also lacked any colonies in Africa, meaning that they would have to rely on foreign ports to take on coal and provisions. Thank God. Can you imagine how brutal a Russian colony in Africa would be? <laughs> yeah. Now, luckily for Russia, they did have an ally with an extensive presence in the region, the French. Unluckily for Russia, France was at that time actively courting in the alliance with Britain. Indeed, the Entente Cordiale would be signed in April of 1904. The French were thus hesitant to help out the Russians in fear of jeopardizing their relationship with the British. Now, in the end, the French would allow the Russians the use of their African ports, but only reluctantly. In order to provide coal for the fleet, Rochetsvensky had to charter a private company, the German Hamburg America Line. Britain protested this to Germany, but the German government did not intervene. In reality, as you mentioned, Kaiser Wilhelm was actively goading Russia on, hoping to use the war to drive a wedge between Russia and France and or France and Britain. Wilhelm and Nikki are, are cousins. They're directly related. And uh, Wilhelm is like actively like wants uh, Russia to fight Japan um, to weaken him. And like Nikki's like, B you're going to come join the war on my side, right? <laughs> like, like you're coming. Yeah, yeah. I got you, bro. I got no, bro. You got this, man. You got this. I'm right behind you. Like <laughs> my, my favorite thing is how in, in, in their letters, he will. Wilhelm will address himself as Admiral of the West and um, call Nicholas Admiral of the East. Uh, you know, a lot of people will like show the pictures of Wilhelm and Nicholas and I think it's like Edward VII, uh, the King of Britain, together and be like, oh, they all look the same. They're all related. You know, they were all friends or whatever. They disliked each other, generally. Wilhelm thought that Nicholas... But they Nicholas... disliked everyone. Like, <laughs> like but they, they, they were... They were cousins. Like, I hate most of my cousins. Yeah. The funny thing with Wilhelm and Nicholas is that they correctly identify the flaws in each other while being oblivious of the flaws of themselves. Like, Nicholas thinks that Wilhelm is, like, a warmonger, which he is. And Wilhelm thinks that Nicholas is a naive idiot, which he is. <laughs> but, like, Wilhelm is trying to play some, like, 5D chess, and it's not going to work. Yeah, but, like, if there's anything you need to know, like, to give you a sense of the mental capability of Nicholas II, is that he gets, like, complete death note bamboozled by Kaiser Wilhelm, who, <laughs> not exactly an intellectual titan. No. <laughs> no. Okay, so a little reductive, let's talk about why Russia is sending this fleet over. The original purpose of the 2nd Pacific Squadron was simple. Sail to the Far East, relieve the 1st Pacific Squadron, hold up in Port Arthur, work with that fleet in sweeping the Japanese from the sea. Combined, the 1st and 2nd Squadrons would significantly outnumber Togo's forces. Without control over the seas, the Japanese could not hope to support the army they had landed in Manchuria. However, by August of 1904, this plan had been called into doubt. The Japanese army had begun their siege of Port Arthur. The city was well defended by a series of hills, but if the Japanese managed to capture those hills, they would be able to fire down both at the city and the Russian ships in the harbor with their artillery. Seeking to avoid the destruction of the 1st Pacific Squadron, Tsar Nicholas 
ordered its new commanding officer, Admiral Vitgif, to take his ships and break out of the Japanese blockade and sail north to the safer but more remote Siberian port of Vladivostok. Vitgif's fleet set sail on August the 10th and almost immediately made contact with Togo's forces. Two battle lines opened fire. At first, the Russians seemed to finally be getting the better of their enemy. Togo's flagship Mikasa was badly damaged and rendered nearly inoperable. As things were starting to look up, a Japanese shell hit the bridge of the Russian flagship Zarevich, instantly killing Vitgif. So now that's two uh, fleet commanders down, and his command staff. The Russian fleet fell into disarray. Most of their ships eventually made it back to Port Arthur, while others made their way to Chinese ports, where the ships were interned by neutral officers in accord with international laws. The remnants of the 1st Pacific Squadron now had little to do but await their fate. And if I know anything about Jay, I bet solid 200 bucks that he's thought about where Mikasa sits in the <laughs> aesthetic uh, hierarchy of Japanese flagships. It's a, it's a nice looking ship. You know, pre-dreadnoughts are generally overlooked by a lot of a lot of naval history fans. It's sort of like a very awkward stage in the development of the battleship. They're a lot less sleek than, you know, dreadnoughts, which you'll get a little bit later. But I like pre-dreadnoughts. They have a very, almost like a steampunk, which because steampunk is influenced by this era, aesthetic to them. I love being instantly proven correct. With the fall of Port Arthur and the first Pacific Squadron along with it seemingly almost guaranteed, Rojavinsky hoped that the whole relief mission would be called off. He had little hopes of defeating the Japanese Navy on his own. Zara however, persisted. Second Squadron would set sail according to plan. Officially, Port Arthur was still the target, but everyone knew that in all likelihood, the squadron would have run the gauntlet and made its way to Vladivostok. What exactly would do then, if it survived, was left for future consideration. So, like, the whole point that they were originally putting this together for is not moot, but uh, severely less... It's not looking up. No, it's not looking good. Now, the 2nd Pacific Squadron set sail on October the 15th, 1904, from the Baltic port of Libau. Now, this was nearly a full half a year after the voyage had been ordered. The delay was largely due to Roshetsvensky taking as much as time as possible to train his crews and refit his ships. In spite of his best efforts, the morale of the fleet was grim. Due to personnel shortages, nearly half of its enlisted complement was made up of recently conscripted peasants. And to just be clear from the era, like, when we say conscripted peasants, these guys probably haven't traveled 20 miles from their hometown. No, like, they're, um... Uh, the, the, <laughs> they're about to go halfway around the world. Yeah, like, the, the Tsar's Last Armada, which is one of the books that I was using for this, like, recounts a story of, like, peasants who had come from remote villages with, like, 30 people of them in the Russian interior, have never seen any modern machinery, and get stuck in, like, these iron beasts, and, like, they just find it, like, depressing just to be in them. Because it's just so foreign. Yeah, we're going to talk about, uh, the, the you're like, oh, uh, steampunk, uh, ships are, are cool. Uh, no, no, they're <laughs> not. But we will, we'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the rest is augmented with reservists and men who were previously seen as unfit for conscription due to physical or political reasons. A gunnery officer complained that one half of these men had to be taught everything because they knew nothing, while the other half had to be taught everything because what they did know was obsolete. In the ball held prior to the departure, the captain of the battleship Alexander III surprised the guests by stating, quote, You wish us victory. It goes without saying, we wish it too. But there will be no victory. I am afraid we will lose half the squadron on our way to the Far East. If this does not happen, the Japanese will annihilate us. Their ships are better and they are real sailors. I can promise you one single thing. We will all die, but never surrender. I love how, like, this is how psychotic this era, and you know what, our current era, like, 
there i'm not gonna say where i work but i work for uh at, at a big um a chain company and like there's like training stuff and stuff there's stuff where like every employee in the store knows this is stupid and yet we all do it everyone on the expedition down to the motherfucker who mopped the poop deck knew this was a bad idea and they did it anyway which just goes to show how little power like like 99.99999% of people had in determining the fate of their lives in this period. <laughs> yeah. Now, as if to prove the captain's worries correct, the fleet got off to a fairly inauspicious start. Rochesvensky's flagship, Suvorov, ran aground leaving port. Another one of his the battleships flagship. lost its anchor, <laughs> and a third broke down. After taking time to repair, the fleet made its way to Denmark, where they prepared to do battle with the enemy. God, that's like backing into the garage door on your way out. <laughs> Alright, so chalked it up for our first incident. On to our second. We'll, we'll probably have a map up on the YouTube video, but so at this point, they've just left the Baltic, and we're now entering, you know, the North Sea... The, the, around the top of Europe. Let's be honest. Most of y'all motherfuckers don't know the names of these seas. It's the North Sea. Water. Who, who, who gives a shit? We're in the water the no on the nor North Sea, the north of, of, of Europe. Uh, so we're like 5%, if that, into our journey. The following events, generally known as the Dogger Bank incident, would come to be remembered as perhaps the most infamous part of the Second Pacific squadron's entire voyage i mean i guess that means it's all up from here <laughs> before we go into the incident itself we got to give a little context which jay in the script has said that m many retellings of the voyage fail to do so because you know he likes to point out how much better than he is of all of the uh pop history content which we are definitely not part of spying in the late her production values aren't high enough. Actually, no. I had the shit out of this. Do you know how many little <laughs> lip smacks this motherfucker on the other mic makes when he talks? Do you have any idea how many hours of my life have been dedicated to deleting Jay's lip spasms? I worked so fucking hard for you people. Okay, so context. Spying in the late 19th and early 20th century looked very different from what we're familiar with today. Most nations, including Russia, had no formal foreign intelligence services. Intelligence gathering was largely done on a far more informal basis, with individual generals, ambassadors, ministers running their own spy rings. These figures would contract out the work to freelance spies. We see freelance spies, but what we're talking about is colorful figures, pilots, captains, dancers, socialites, who would in turn rely on rumors and gossips to create their reports. In such an environment, exaggeration was endemic. Spies who reported, all clear, no enemy activity detected, would soon find themselves cut off from any funding. As such, there was a strong motivation to embellish everything. Asian tourists and merchants became saboteurs. Lonesome individuals walking the beach at night became spies. Dimly lit silhouettes on the horizon became enemy warships. With enough reports coming in, an entire ghostly Japanese fleet stalking the North Sea appeared in the minds of Russian officers. Also, side note, I would personally argue this is not actually <laughs> that different from how spying works now. It's just <laughs> there's a whole central intelligence agency to go through before they get to the command. But, like, they're still fucking going yeah. off of, like, what some guy told some guy told some guy at a market. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. You know, it's totally just the Havana syndrome. We gotta do a podcast about yeah. Havana Syndrome. I don't care if it's 20 <laughs> minutes long, because there's not a lot there. But, like, it's stupid as fuck. 
these people are giving billions of dollars. I'm sorry, Jay. Uh, the Dogger incident. Uh, uh, and and okay. So so, to be clear, the Russians think that the Japanese have sent ships from Japan to the North Sea, like a lot of them. Sort of. <laughs> well, we'll get into that R real quick. Did they? No. Fair enough. Now, the paramount fear of the day was the potential presence of Japanese torpedo boats. The invention of the self-propelled torpedo in 1866 had brought about a revolution in naval warfare thinking. Prior to the torpedo, ships relied primarily on their guns to damage each other. To fight larger, more heavily armored ships, one needed faster, heavier shells. This in turn necessitated larger guns and larger ships to carry them. The end result was a clear hierarchy, in which the largest warships were generally only threatened by similarly large enemies. The torpedo changed all that. A small boat carrying a few torpedoes could theoretically cripple a battleship 100 times its size. Indeed, the potential of the torpedo was displayed during the attack of Port Arthur when three Russian vessels were put out of action by torpedo hits. This is like if littoral combat ships were actually good and not a scam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I knew Jay would laugh at that, and there's three <laughs> other people on Earth who would laugh at that joke, but Jay's amongst them, and I love you for it, buddy. Now, of course, the presence of Japanese torpedo boats in the North Sea seems absurd to anyone who has ever looked at a map. Still, the fear was not quite as absurd as it might seem in hindsight. The Japanese Navy ordered many of their ships from British shipyards. It was not totally unrealistic to think that with the correct timing, they might launch a few torpedo boats out of these shipyards, take them into international waters where they could then be armed and handed over to Japanese crews, and then use them to attack the Russians. During the U.S. Civil War, Confederate commerce raiders launched attacks from European shipyards in a pretty similar fashion. This fear seemed to materialize during the waning hours of October 20th. That's, that's five days into uh, our journey and the sea madness is already uh, setting in. The crew of the Russian repair ship Kamachka radioed Ro Roshetsvinsky. The Kamchatka. Hmm? Kamchatka? Kamchatka. Yeah. Yeah. So these guys, this is, you know, random repair ship, they radio Roshetsvinsky that they're under attack. Now, Roshetsvinsky is initially suspicious of the claim. The slow and old Kamchatka was an unlikely target of attack, but the radio cables continued to pour in from the vessel. Okay, I have to ask. This is an actual radio, right? Like, they're sending, um... Like Morse code over radio waves, like can be. Yes, this is Morse. Yeah, code. okay, that's what I thought. So, and that would um, explain these short messages, such as "All lights shut down," "Attack from all directions," "Torpedo boat closer than a cable length," "Steering in different directions to escape torpedo boats," "Heading east at twelve knots." Roshetsvinsky's own men saw no torpedo boats. Um, by the way. Most people have, like, very rarely experienced pitch black actual darkness in our modern um, age of electronic light. It is very difficult to explain how dark it is on the ocean uh, when you're alone. And uh, most of these ships are barely, are, are only, like, tangentially in sight of one another, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, ships only sail close together when they want to get a a, a shot a uh, you know shot for the cameras they don't actually do that in in real life because that's how you all get killed no <laughs> so in this like situation where you like you're just staring out the searchlight at like inky nothingness and you're super bored it's really easy to like see um shadows of the dark shall we say Rochezvinsky's own men saw no torpedo boats he ordered the Kamchatka to turn back to the west lest they get separated from the main fleet. However, he sent a message to the jump cut, get, to the ship, asking them if they could see any torpedo boats. Much to his anger, their reply was simple. We cannot see any. So it's like, you motherfuckers were screaming, and now you can't see any of them. For a moment, a crisis seemed to have been averted. 
the lull would prove to be short-lived. Shortly after midnight, the crew of the Suvorov, that's the flagship, spotted several unlit ships approaching the Russian fleet. Roshesvinsky ordered all searchlights to be switched on, lighting up the previously dark sea. The ship exploded with activity, with its crew readying themselves for battle. Suddenly, an unknown vessel entered the beam of one of those searchlights. Thinking it to be a torpedo boat, Roshesvinsky ordered his men to open fire. As Suvorov's guns thundered away, the rest of the fleet began to open fire as well. The ghostly torpedo boat, however, seemed to slip away, vanishing out of sight. A new vessel was now lit up, and the gunners trained their weapons on it instead. The silhouette of this vessel, however, was less mysterious. It was clearly that of a fishing trawler. Roshetsvensky ordered his men to cease firing on the trawler, but they continued to target other seemingly more sinister silhouettes with their guns. A flash of light was detected to the left of the battleship, and its crew once again opened fire. The target of this attack frantically signaled back at Suvorov. The flagship had opened fire on the Russian cruisers Donskoy and Aurora. It's worth making clear that I assume all of the people manning these guns are bored as shit, annoyed as fuck, uh, really depressed, sleep-deprived, and possibly intoxicated. So, and, and don't know how to do their jobs. So, so just, just I for, mean, for context. They, the British had rum, the Russians had vodka. Like, it seems like a dumb stereotype, but like, no, they literally were issued vodka every day. <laughs> it was part of their rations. Yeah. Because like, they knew that no one would do this job if they weren't high. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great, like, you just show up for your job at Walmart and you're just, like, issued, like, you know, uh, um, some weed in a baggie, smoke it on your break? I mean, I believe that would be happening. Certainly. All right, what happened next, Jay? Dismayed, Roshetsvensky ordered a total ceasefire. The guns of the 2nd Pacific Squadron fell silent, the whole affair having lasted only around 10 minutes. Roshetsvensky knew that his fleet had likely damaged civilian fishing vessels, but he also feared that Japanese torpedo boats were still in the area. The Russian fleet would sail onwards, not stopping to rescue the crews of the trawlers. Roshetsvensky had been certain that at least one Japanese torpedo boat had been present during the incident. The rest of Europe would soon discover that this was not the case. The Russians had in reality opened fire on a group of British fishing trawlers. Two fishermen had been killed, six injured, and one trawler sunk. In addition, a Russian friendly fire damaged the cruiser Aurora, killing one sailor and the ship's priest. Struck down the man of God. That's a great, uh, that, 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 that's a great omen. I'll remind you that sailors are the most superstitious people, uh, on, on the planet. Athletes have nothing on sailors. Newspapers in Britain erupted in indignation against the Russian fleet. The Times stated that it is almost inconceivable that any men calling themselves seamen, however frightened they might be, could spend 20 minutes bombarding a fleet of fishing vessels without discovering the nature of their target. The public called for Roshevitsky to be arrested and stand trial, and the government seemed to agree. The British home fleet set off in pursuit of the Russians, who by now had transited the English Channel and were making their way to the coast of Spain when the Mediterranean fleet converged on them from the east. Combined, the British had 25 battleships in the area, enough to sink the entire Russian navy. One British admiral boasted that he would first attack the Russians with just four battleships as an act of chivalry. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed. French diplomats, worried about the prospect of a war between their two allies, stepped in and negotiated a settlement. Russia would apologize and pay an indemnity to the crew of the trawlers. War had been avoided, but the Russians had been publicly humiliated, and the British would go out of their way to obstruct the efforts throughout much of the village. So literally just stepping on toes, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> During the midst of this diplomatic activity, the Russian fleet stopped in Vigo, Spain, to take on coal. As they left, they were shadowed by a squadron of British cruisers. Observing them through his binoculars, Roshetsvensky almost broke down in tears. 
Such was the gap in observable quality between the British sailors and his own. One of his officers remarked that he wished the two fleets would have it out then and there. When asked what he meant, he said that a battle with the British would spare them the trouble of going halfway around the world to be sunk. I just had the very macabre thought of, well, this couldn't be uh, that bad because there were surely survivors because that's how we know that story. <laughs> but like, <laughs> we haven't even left European waters yet and we're already two guys <laughs> down. Of course, such a battle would not occur. The Russians continued on, reaching Tangier by November. The Sultan of Morocco gave them a warm reception. Roshetsvensky rewarded the favor a few days later, when one of the Russian transports accidentally severed the telegraph cable connecting North Africa to Europe with its anchor. <laughs> At this point, Roshetsvensky decided to split the fleet. A small group of lighter and older ships would make the shorter voyage through the Suez Canal, while the battleships and the rest of the fleet would round the tip of Africa. The two groups would ideally re reunite in Madagascar the following year. The journey around Africa would prove to be a physically demanding one for the Russians. The closer the squadron got to the equator, the more the temperature rose. Their next stop was Dakar in French Senegal. While the French reluctantly allowed the Russians to take on coal in their port, they offered little other assistance. The Russian crews would have barely over a day to coal their ships. Working in the hot tropical climate, several died of heat stroke. You gotta remember, most of these guys are from, you know, some village called uh, Viroslavsk or something in, like, fucking middle of nowhere, cold as shit. Yeah. Ah, uh, they're, they're on a metal deck. God we damn. we've we've mentioned it coaling a few times before and we'll mention it again um these are not gasoline powered ships with a gas ship you know it's just a matter of plumbing you hook up the hoses and the pumps and you just fill the tanks with the coal ship we are talking about men physically carrying buckets of coal into it the the holds of the ships dumping them and then like yeah, repeating shovels, this again and again wheelbarrows yeah it, and and coal is nasty yeah, coaling was generally considered, like, the worst part of a career at sea at this point in time. And metal decks of these ships just reflecting, barely, you know, fully exposed. In order to reduce the number of future stops that would be necessary, Roshetzinski had crammed his ship to the gills. Each ship carried double the normal load, with coal being stuffed into any spare area, including cabins and gun turrets. Before long, the that could have ended so badly, goddamn. Before long, the interiors of the Russian ship were coated in a layer of coal dust. As temperatures within the ship soared to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 38 degrees Celsius, this dust mixed with sweat and humidity to coat everything in a sticky layer of grime. The second squadron continued on, reaching Gabon by the end of November. Here, the fleet took on more coal and received telegrams updating them on the war and issuing new orders. The fighting in Manchuria was going poorly. Port Arthur was unlikely to hold out. This was of no surprise to Roshetsvinsky. What was more surprising, and perhaps even unwelcome, was news from St. Petersburg. The Tsar had formed a third Pacific squadron, oh hells yeah, with the dregs of the Baltic fleet. Those ships that had been deemed too old, too slow, and too unreliable by Roshetsvinsky. The squadron was the brainchild of Commander Nikolai Klado, an ambitious officer who had personal connections with the Romanovs, having served as a tutor for the Tsar's brother and cousin. This is a diplomatic way of saying that uh, this is a Nepo baby uh, who's got a harebrained scheme and is uh, fucking going off and going to get them all killed. Upon reaching Madagascar, Roshesvinsky was to wait for the third squadron's arrival and incorporate it into his fleet. Remember, uh, I believe at this point in history, Madagascar is owned by the French. Yes. And uh, who who do not like them at this point. And you know, it's 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 also very, very hot. What was equally telling was the news Roshesvinsky didn't receive. 
His orders made new, no mention of the new cruisers purchased from Argentina or Chile. Situation was obvious. The Tsar had been swayed by Clado into going back on his promise of buying those ships. Having hoped to be reinforced by powerful modern warships, Rorschach was instead being delivered a fleet of junkers even more decrepit than that of his own. But hey, I get, I bet Clado's uh, men, uh, Clado's plan saved money. Yeah. <laughs> Now, to top it all off, Roshetsvensky received one final infuriating telegram while at Gabon. As if to provoke his by now well-known temper, the British has sent a message to him sarcastically warning him of the presence of British fishing boats near Durban. Hells, yeah. <laughs> the apoplectic Roshetsvensky sent back a response threatening to sink any trawler that came across his fleet at night with their lights off. This is just trolling. I, th this is like high diplomacy, and they are... It's not a new concept, folks. So to recap so far, we go out of... We get out of port. Uh, we, you know, bump into some rocks. Uh, we kill two of our own guys and start an international incident because we get spooked in the middle of the night. It's, it, it, it's so hot, it's boiling everyone's brains. Uh, literally everything is coated in black dust and grime. Um, several people have died of heat stroke, uh, and we are getting reinforcements, uh, by, like, 50-plus-year-old ships, um, headed by a guy who is almost certainly an unqualified idiot. Yeah. And we haven't even made it to the Japanese yet. Yeah. <laughs> With little remaining hope of success, the second squadron continued onwards. Many of its sailors had picked up exotic pets and venereal diseases during their brief bits of shore leave in Gabon. Both would now run rampant throughout the fleet. You gotta remember, these guys are cooped up on a ship for, like, weeks at a time, alright? And now they get to, like, one of the most diverse and fun parts of Africa. Uh, these, these boys, they're gonna... They're, they're gonna fucking cut loose. And like again, these guys don't think that they're mu that they're um they're gonna live much longer. Yeah. They have no reason to save, so their money is going into like the purse of every hooker and guy with a weird looking thing on his shoulder uh, that they can get their hands on. <laughs> yeah, I do find it interesting that like the two things that they spend their money on are fucking and pets. But I get, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess that's companionship. Yeah. Like, 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 they just want human connection. I guess that makes sense. Or non-human connection. The weather finally began to cool as their ships approached the southern part of Africa. The fleet paused off the shore of Angola to take on more coal. This time, they would not rely on a port, but instead coal their ships at sea. A very long and difficult process. Everything we said about coaling, now we're doing it, basically just like loading it from a transport ship, unloading from a transport ship and onto a battleship. People in modern navies regularly are injured and die in in uh ship to ship refueling yes. to this day. Yeah. Uh, like it involves like a dude sit like laying on a plank that is suspended like sixty feet up by a crane. And it's not the best job. Yeah. To their credit, the sailors were able to pull it off, and the fleet now moved to round the tip of Africa. Rochette Svensky's decision to send the older and smaller ships of his fleet through the Suez was vindicated as his squadron battled their way through an intense storm of the sort that frequently plagues the Cape of Good Hope. The fleet was battered, but somehow remained intact as it finally entered the Indian Ocean. There was little time to relax, as the crew still had to be on the lookout for Japanese vessels. Throughout the Second Pacific Fleet's journey, the same kinds of rumors that had led to the Dogger Bank incident kept pace with them. At each port of call, the Russians received new reports relocating the shadowy Japanese fleet from place to place. Perhaps they were in South Africa, Arabia, Ceylon, or the Maldives. The Russians constantly had to be on the lookout for an enemy, that was, in reality, nowhere near them. The 2nd Pacific Squadron reached Madagascar by December of 1904. 
Here, they were finally given the opportunity to rest and recuperate. They were joined by the ships that had been sent through the Suez and awaited the 3rd Squadron. Alright, I wanted to read this part. The sailors used the opportunity to enjoy their time on shore, drinking, gambling, and frequenting brothels. Many of them brought more pets back aboard their ships. One sailor noted, Wherever you look now, you see birds, beasts, and vermin. A deck oxen are standing ready to be slaughtered for meat, to say nothing of fowls, geese, and ducks. In the cabins are monkeys, parrots, and chameleons. So, yeah, part of these things are because they want fresh meat, which, like, yeah, when you're you're fucking eating hardtack and, and shit on um, for, for weeks, I get that. But also, like... I'm just thinking of, like, the bird shit and monkey shit that's <laughs> getting mixed in this coal dust and grime. This has got to be the worst smell that's ever existed on Earth. <laughs> Have you ever been to a waste treatment plant, Jay? No. Well, depending on how the wind is blowing, you do get close to it relatively quickly. It's not, like, that, that bad, but, like... God, I mean, like, I mean, the Russians might smell worse than all of that combined. You know, this is not, they're not taking showers. Unfortunately, this lax behavior led to a breakdown in discipline. After a group of drunken sailors destroyed a pub, Roshizvinsky, after a... Jay, this is why commas exist. After a group of drunken sailors destroyed a pub, Roshinsvinsky flew into a fit of rage, banning his men from visiting brothels and gambling dens and ordering all pets to be removed from the ship. Minor mutinies broke out throughout the fleet, though they were all put down successfully. Boo! I mean, one, one of the fun things that, like, y- you know, you have these, like, little mutinies, uh, like, acts of disobedience, and... When a lot of these guys are arrested, like Roshasensky's officers are like, oh, you got, you got to shoot these guys. You know, you, you kill mutineers. Like, that was standard practice. And he's like, well, I don't want to order anybody to be killed because, like, they're going to just, if they just stay with the fleet, we're all going to have the chance to go and fight the Japanese and maybe they'll die then anyways. <laughs> this is the voyage of the damned. They are already in hell. Now, Roshidzvinsky has called an end to the fun, but don't worry, guys, he has an alternative. This time would much better be used on training. This went poorly. During one exercise, Suvorov's gunners managed to completely miss a target buoy and instead hit the ship toy. God damn! They hit the ship towing the buoy. That guy's so angry. The guy driving that shit. A lot, a lot of binoculars going in the ocean. <laughs> that 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 skipper is inventing new slurs <laughs> level of anger. <laughs> News from the front did little to lift Russian spirits. The Japanese army had captured the strategic 203 meter hill overlooking Port Arthur in December. That's some creative naming there. They wasted little time in dragging their artillery up the hill and using it to rain shells down on the 1st Pacific Squadron, as was expected. One by one, the remnants of the fleet were put out of action. The Russian commander finally surrendered on January the 2nd. The 1st Pacific Squadron had ceased to exist, all of its ships being either sunk, scuttled, or captured. Meanwhile, the situation on the home front was no better. On January 22nd, the Imperial Guard soldiers opened fire on a crowd of protesters that were attempting to deliver a petition to Tsar Nicholas II. This is their Bloody Sunday, isn't it? Yes. Yeah! I remember my Russian history. Over a hundred civilians were killed, sparking a series of unrest that would come to known as the First Russian Revolution. Many of the sailors sympathized with the protesters, and copies of revolutionary literature began circulating amongst the crews. Now, in the end, there would be no revolution amongst the men of the 2nd Pacific Squadron. Many simply just lacked the energy for it. The start of the rainy season brought with it outbreaks of malaria, tuberculosis, typhus, and all kinds of fungal infections. Can these crackers not catch a fucking break? (laughs) 
My by... God, or like Buddha or whoever's in charge here. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <clears throat> by March, most simply wanted to leave Madagascar and get on with their fate. <laughs> the third squadron was still weeks away, but Roshet Svensky's pac patience had run out. That's my, my new slogan for Madagascar. Madagascar, a fate worse than death. He was not going to let his fleet waste away while awaiting the arrival of a bunch of ships that he referred to as self-sinkers in an archaeological collection of naval architecture. On March the 16th, they set sail. The trip across the Indian Ocean was generally seen as a relatively easy one. Anticipating boredom, several officers had disobeyed orders and brought along with them more pets from Madagascar. The captain of the Aurora had acquired a python, while his officers brought along crocodiles, tortoises, lemurs, and chameleons. Which are all going to die miserable deaths. <laughs> yeah. The crew complained that they were too afraid to go to sleep in the company of such beasts. Aboard Suvorov, a monkey stole a religious icon and threw it overboard. The crew nicknamed the primate Iconoclast and had it exiled to another ship in the fleet. Any other researcher would deem that a detail uh, too trivial to go into the script, but uh, I, Jay, Jay's attracted to that reference. This is to the Byzantine Empire <laughs> shit. Like, like, like flies on a cow pie. In general, the Indian Ocean crossing went well. The most difficult parts were, was the process of coaling, which had to be done at sea, and the frequent delays caused by various ships in the fleet experiencing issues with their engines. Uh, by the way, th this is like happening in the background of this entire voyage. It's like a ship will break down and the rest have to wait for it. So this is like a constant thing. In April, the 2nd Pacific Squadron reached the Strait of Malacca. Now, few had expected Rochetsvensky to utilize this waterway. Uh, this is a narrow strait connecting the Indian Ocean to the South China Sea, and it's under full British control. The Japanese were not likely to do battle in the confined waterways of the Strait of Malacca, but they could have waited near the mouth of its exit to attack the Russians. Rochetsvensky chose Malacca nonetheless, most likely out of a desire to simply get on with the mission. I'm going to summarize again because we are nearing the merciful end. So, run aground, getting out. Uh, they cause an international incident and kill two guys in Europe. They are the pariah of the French and the British. Coaling accidents, sweltering heat. People die from heat stroke. They fucking... You've, you've, you, between Gabon and Madagascar, you have, like, every disease. You, you have syphilis, you have malaria, you have fungal infections. There's, there's people, <laughs> these guys are considered so miserable that they don't get shot for mutinying because that would be a better alternative to their current existence. Their promised backup of shiny new battleships is replaced by incompetent clunkers. And we finally, and everything is covered in layers of animal shit, coal dust, sweat, and I assume other human discharge. Yeah. <laughs> the final major stop made by the second squadron would be in Kamran Bay off of French Indochina on April the 14th. If he goes to Indochina... Jay, you're very lucky I'm not allowed to say that full quote. <laughs> Here, Roshatsvinsky received categorical orders to wait for the third squadron before proceeding. They would finally arrive on the 8th of May. God, so even more waiting in this sweltering heat and fucking python shit. The extra weeks spent at Kamran provided the Japanese with ample time to finish repairing their ships and prepping their crews for battle. Because, of course, like, the Japanese know they're coming! Because... Yeah. This is all international incidents and fucking... Because it's so slow, like, there's no... I mean, the, the the French are basically reporting every stop straight to the British, and the British are reporting it straight to the Japanese. So, yeah. 
Togo has been keeping up with the entire journey. <laughs> So the fall of Part Arthur made Rochevetsky's final destination obvious, Vladivostok. The question was what route to take to Vladivostok. Save his option would be swing out eastwards in the Pacific and loop around Japan, sailing around the northern tip of Honshu, Hokkaido, or even Sakhalin to reach the port. This route offered the fleet the possibility of remaining undetected by the Japanese. And the problem was the Russians did not have enough coal to make such a journey. Coaling in the Pacific was dangerous at best. The other route was more direct and more dangerous. It involved sailing straight through the Korean Strait, right between the Korean Peninsula and Japan, and on to Vladivostok. Here, secrecy would be impossible. The Russians would have to use their advantage and firepower to force their way through whatever Togo had waiting for him. Roshetsvinsky knew that this was the only realistic chance he had of reaching Vladivostok. He knew that Togo likely knew this as well. Nonetheless... This was the route that was selected. We're not going to talk about, like, honor culture and shit, but, like, the re this isn't just called the Voyage of the Dam because, like, it was, like, cursed or, like, just a series of mishaps. It's, like, they, they, these people know they are going to die and have decided there is nothing to be that can be done to stop it. Jay, would you call that accurate? I think, yeah, there is definitely a very fatalistic attitude amongst um, amongst the, the crews and the, even the officers. And for cultural reasons, and I don't think it's just like, oh, these old people in history believe in chivalry and shit. Like, humans need dignity, you know? Like, yeah. at a certain point, like, saying, well, at least we're going to go down swinging. Like, if you need something to keep you going, like, I mean, otherwise, why not just blow your brains out, right? Like... Uh. As the Russian fleet, now composed of both the 2nd and 3rd squadron, sailed north, everyone aboard knew that it would not be long before they'd finally have to face the enemy. Uh, side note, Jay, is that guy who's like came up with the idea for the 3rd fleet, is he on the 3rd fleet? Was he like suicidal enough to do this himself? No, he's not on it. <laughs> um, he doesn't go with it. Absolutely, fuck yeah, fuck yes, yes, yes. God, I can't wait to meet that. We wait to meet that dude in hell. So the second and third squadron, they're all sailing north. Everybody aboard, knowing that it would not be long before they finally had to face the enemy. Roshevsky detached various support vessels and sent them in various directions and attempted to confuse the Japanese, but he knew that such a tactic was unlikely to succeed. I imagine he's thinking that a lot of his boats just aren't going to be useful in the fight. Yeah. On the night of May the 26th, the Russians reached the Korean Strait, sailing just to the east of the island of Tsushima. In the early hours of the 27th, they were spotted by the Japanese are auxiliary cruiser Shinano Maru, which reported their location by radio to Togo. The Japanese combined fleet was nearby, having correctly predicted Roshevsky's movements. Now they sailed to finally finish off the Russian Navy. And this is basically the entire Russian Navy at this point. Yeah, I mean, you got like some of like the Black Sea fleet, but like that was never much of a fleet to begin with. Um, but yes. So this is what will come to be known as the Battle of Tsushima. But before we get to it, let's just kind of like, let's just kind of go over, you know, what the two admirals are working with. Now, the core of the Russian fleet at Tsushima consisted of 11 battleships, of which one was the near obsolete Nicholas I, and three were coastal defense battleships that were of limited use in open waters. Like, these are designed just to like operate near the coastline. Uh, these were the four ships that had formed the core of the, the third squadron. The remaining seven were all relatively modern. In addition to this, the Russians had nine cruisers, nine destroyers, and various smaller vessels. The Japanese, in comparison, had five battleships, of which four were modern and one was near obsolete. 
In addition, they had around 23 cruisers, 21 destroyers, and various smaller vessels, including dozens of the infamous torpedo boats. On paper, the Russian battle line possessed heavier firepower than the Japanese due to having more battleships. This was just about the only advantage the Russians had. Their cruiser and destroyer forces were hopelessly outnumbered. Togo's ships were also faster. His battleships could sustain 15 knots for a prolonged period of time, whereas Roshetsvensky's could only hope to reach 14 knots and only in very short bursts. The Japanese crews were well-rested, better trained, and had experience from a year's worth of combat operations. The only combat that most of the Russians had seen involved shooting at civilian fishermen in the North Sea. God bless him. Togo took his time in arranging his fleet for the attack. By 1.40 p.m., the two opposing fleets made contact with each other. Japanese lines sailing parallel to the Russians... The battle began shortly thereafter. Russian gunnery initially proved better than expected, with Roshasvinsky's battleship landing several salvos on their Japanese counterparts. The Japanese, however, used their speed to move along ahead of the Russians, turning to the east and cutting ahead of them, crossing their T in naval parlance. If you study any naval history in this period, the first thing they're going to tell you about is crossing the T. Basically, you want to get your position where all of your guns can shoot at them with, like, f as few of their guns shooting at you as possible. So because, like, your broadside is to them and their, like, bows are to you, you are capping the T. Like, literally imagine two lines and then so it's, it's safe for you. get it. We'll have a diagram on the thing. I'll have the diagram on the thing. I'm the one who puts the diagrams out there, goddammit. Japanese battleships and cruisers concentrated their fire on the lead Russian vessels. Within minutes, Suvorov was dead in the water, its engines knocked out by enemy fire. Roshasvinsky was badly wounded, ending his ability to command the fleet. Command briefly passed to the captain of battleship Alexander III, but she was soon set ablaze by high explosive shells. A third battleship, Osiabla, sunk shortly thereafter, becoming the first modern battleship in history to be sunk by enemy gunfire. Roshasvinsky's injury meant that overall command of the fleet passed to Admiral Nabogatov, whose 3rd Division was made up of the aging ships of the 3rd Squadron. The 3rd Division attempted to sail around the Japanese and resume course toward Vladivostok. Literally not even fight. Togo ignored the geriatric ships and focused fire on the remaining modern Russian battleships. Alexander III attempted to charge the Japanese battle lines to provide cover for the rest of the fleet. She was pounded by enemy gunfire, eventually capsizing at 6.30 p.m. Brodino was next to fall, exploding spectacularly when a Japanese shell detonated her magazine. As dusk approached, Togo withdrew his battleships from the engagement. The surviving Russian ships had been reduced to sailing in poorly organized clumps for safety. Now, the Japanese torpedo boats and destroyers descended upon them. Suvorov was hit at 7.30 p.m., sinking shortly thereafter. The unconscious Roshasvetsky had been evacuated to a support vessel hours prior and would survive the engagement, which was probably not a mercy, honestly. The torpedo boats continued their attacks, crippling an additional Russian battleship and cruiser. After a short respite, Japanese destroyers descended once more on the Russian fleet shortly after midnight. This time they dropped mines ahead of the Russian vessels. The battleship Nevarine hit these mines, capsizing and sinking almost immediately. Dawn on the 28th found the surviving Russian ships scattered amongst the strait. The largest concentration of ships, led by Nabogatov, found itself surrounded by the Japanese battle line. With the only alternative being certain destruction, Nabogatov ordered his ships to surrender. The rest of the day continued similarly, with lone Russian ships generally surrendering to their Japanese pursuers. In the confusion, some actually managed to elude being captured. Two destroyers and an auxiliary cruiser actually managed to reach... Vladivostok. God bless them. Other survivors made for neutral ports in China and the Philippines, turning over their vessels to be interned. Perhaps the most successful of all of them was the auxiliary cruiser Andanir, which seemed to disappear from the battlefield before showing back up in Madagascar one month later. Why not? In little over a day of combat, if you can call that combat, 
21 Russian ships, including seven battleships, had been sunk. The bulk of the rest of the fleet had been captured or were in turn neutral ports, and the 2nd Pacific Squadron, along probably with the 3rd, ceased to exist. So, uh, that's fun. Yeah, just to um, provide, uh, you know, casualty figures, the Russians will have uh, 5,045 dead and 6,016 captured. The Japanese will have 117 dead. And uh, in terms of ship sinking, they only lose three torpedo boats. So it is a very lopsided battle. So we're not going to talk too, too much on the end of the war, as it's probably going to be a different episode, and this episode's going on for too long. Suffice to say, uh, the, the it's this kind of weird situation where um, even though the Russians get just utterly clowned on, the Japanese kind of exhaust a lot of their resources doing it, because they are much smaller. Yeah. Um, in the end, they can't push for too many concessions, and um, Roosevelt racistly kind of pushes them to take less. Uh, so this is more of a humiliation defeat than a material defeat for, for Russia. Um, and it, it the Russo-Japanese work, like, on paper, it kind of goes down as a draw, but, like, they lost. And they lost really, really oh, yeah, it, it is, um, in my view, it is pretty clearly a Japanese victory. I mean, if you look at what the Japanese, especially what the Japanese cabinet is really trying to achieve, which is dominion over Manchuria. They achieve that, you know. They'll yeah. maintain that until the you know, 1940s. The the worldwide press didn't really pitch it that way, but that that is it was yeah. a Chinese vict- it was yeah. a Japanese victory. Yeah, I guess the only question remaining is uh, what happens to Roshetsvinsky, this guy who's like one of the four competent people in the Japanese uh, Russian in, in the Russian Navy. Um, doesn't want to do this. Is forced to do it anyway. All of his ideas are shot down. His uh, wanting the new ships is betrayed. How's his, how does his story end, Jay? So he will actually recover from his injuries. And actually, while he's recovering in the hospital, Admiral Togo visits him and tells him, in quote, defeat is the common fate of a soldier. There is nothing to be ashamed of it. The great point is whether we have performed our duty. So Roshetsvansky... Wow will be that's por- like kind of sweet yeah you know the p- the people these days were just utterly psychotic and the things they believe were beyond insane about like gods and uh, gender and all sorts of dumbass shit but like i kind of think togo thought he was like obligated to visit him and I have absolutely zero doubt that Togo believed everything he said. Oh, yeah. Togo is, you know, very much into, like, the British chivalry thing. He, he is, you know, mostly educated in, in British naval schools. And he is, you know, very much buys into that. It's psychotic, but beautiful in a weird, fucked up way. Yeah. So, Roshetsvensky will be court-martialed for the defeat. Uh, and a lot of his supporters yeah, actually will, will point out that he was unconscious when the surrender happened. He was literally Bruh. not in charge. Um, but Roshetsvensky will refuse to basically put the blame on Nabokatov. He will shoulder it entirely himself. And the the czar eventually kind of like realizes this and will give um, basically a very light sentence. Uh, you know, he gets discharged from the navy, but that's about it. Um, he will spend the rest of his life living in Saint Petersburg, uh, basically as a shut in, like doesn't see anybody, doesn't do anything, and will die just a few years later in 1909. I mean, good time to die if you're <laughs> Russian. Yeah. So, yeah, and that that is the uh, that's the uh, the voyage of the damned. So, besides like some smooth sailing uh, and enjoying uh, 
various monkeys and Madagascar horrors, hopefully not at the same time. That's uh that's just L's all around. And you know, I know this is this is no one who's got this podcast, but like does this take the cake? It's uh... Is this the least competent thing we've <laughs> studied? It's up there. I mean I'm Eagle Claw it is me like, of, like the a defense West. of the Capitol in January 6th where yeah. like they were just, just, just the plan was bad. Like it was a bit we're not doing what needed to be done. Yeah. It, it, but it, like this is so much larger in scope. Yeah, I was gonna say like Eagle Claw is like you could argue less realistic of a plan, but also like less disastrous. Like at the end of the day, you're talking about losing a couple helicopters versus and Eagle Claw was carried out by people who were much better trained. Yeah. Like, not not good enough, but... They were at least military people. The, 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 these are not... These are not sailors of, of the line. These are not... Soldiers. These are poor farmers who are ripped from their families. Do we have any, like, final... Ana- I don't know how much, like, there is to analyze about this. Like... Again, your average eighth grader could probably point out everything that's wrong with this because your average American and I assume a, a, a broad eighth grader could is significantly smarter than uh, all of the people who ordered this to happen. Um, you have any like final thoughts or it's just it is kind of it just kind of is what it is to me. It is what it is. Um, you did mention like the the material effects and like it being a symbolic defeat, you know. If this was the the idea that an Asian nation would defeat a major European power um, was, you know, almost unheard of. Yeah, that's a big ramification of this. And, you know, the Russians, this will end the idea of Russia as a top naval power really until the 1950s um, with, with, you know, when the Soviets start really building up their fleet. So, like, it does have pretty important ramifications for the Japanese, which you alluded to earlier, um, it has very important ramifications on their later strategies. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of the fleet itself, it, it kind of just, you know, it is what it is. It was a bad idea from the beginning, increasingly a bad idea as it, as it went along. And, you know, Togo's quote about duty, I think like that's really at the end what, you know, why the Russians kept on going to their fate. It's, no matter how bad things seemed, it's like they had to do their duty and at least put up a fight before eventually, you know, surrendering. All right. This has been the No One Is Competent. So I, I'm usually not this dejected at the end, but that was uh that was a voyage of uh some dams. Uh do you want do you want to hear the uh, the, the the shark fishing story? Will that be less make you feel less dejected? I mean, this podcast is already an hour longer than I wanted to be anyway. <laughs> uh, when they're crossing the Indian Ocean, one of the fun, I guess, not very fun if if you are the shark thing that the, the Russian crews would do, is fish for sharks by, like, dumping large chunks of meat into the ocean. And then they will try to drag I up the shark, some which some of is... those large sharks of meat were the pets that had, like, died instantly <laughs> on the water. Then they would try to drag up the sharks, which mostly failed because that's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, But if they succeeded, then they would shoot the shark with the revolver and then have a a dead shark. So yeah, that 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 was their entertainment. Um, Yeah, I didn't really put that in the script because (laughs) didn't really know where it would fit in, but just a little thing that they would. Oh, but we had to know about the iconoclast monkey. (laughs) Yes, he did. That was required yes. for this 21-page motherfucker. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to say our, 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 our plugs again. No one's listening at this point. I, I can already hear Sam's music in our in my mind. Y'all are not damned. Y'all are going to be great. Uh, hope to see y'all uh, again. Uh, once again, thank you, Leo, for inflicting this upon us. Um... The next episode will be back to Napoleon, and we will have another um, 
uh, suggested episode, probably on the Opium Wars, I am going uh, to go and uh, bang my head against some drywall. Good night. On the voyage of the damned. Are we are we uh, replacing the music with that? No, we're we're replacing the music with uh fucking Clara songs. You <laughs> ask stupid questions, you're gonna get stupid answers. I mean I would be down for that. Might might run into copyright issues. I, I can tell you from experience that if you think getting away with visual copyright is hard, uh, music copyright is... <laughs> <laughs>